What you see here is uh, known in India as a sadhu. Uh, these are itinerant holy men or yogis or even just philosophers. Um, quite a mixed bag, actually, the sadhus. And uh, you never really know what to expect from them, which is kind of the point. The main thing is they're generally considered fairly canny and best left alone by Indian people, Hindus. Uh, occasionally people will have some dealings with them, and usually when there's uh, something religious taking place or uh, one is looking for spiritual guidance from someone who is actually willing to provide such spiritual guidance, which they are not always willing to provide. In fact, often they are out and out hostile, as we see here. In fact, I would say in the majority of the cases, sadhus would prefer to be left the hell alone. Um, not approached at all. Kind of like uh, what we expect uh, were we to transport back into time and try to approach Diogenes, the cynic. We would expect him to tell us to go commit an obscene act with our mothers, which is precisely what this sadhu might be saying to someone who's bugging him or just getting in his face as he sees it. Um, there's a reason for this. Uh, there are a number of reasons. The first one is, of course, uh, this fellow has technically renounced the world. He doesn't want to have any contact with you. Leave him alone. You try to approach him, you're screwing up his renunciation. Uh, secondly, if he is the sort of sadhu or guru who um, seeks or accepts initiates, um, initiates, he will often make it extremely difficult for anyone to become his disciple. Um, you approach, uh, like the more extreme the sect, i.e. the ones that wear hair shirts or cripple their bodies through deliberate self-torture or whatever, or the agoris who are into interesting things like uh, cannibalism and the use of drugs and alcohol. Um, these are extreme sadhus and they will often make it very difficult for you to approach them simply because they want to make sure that anyone who wants to join them is really into it, who is not just some thrill seeker uh, who wants to see these weird holy men get lost is the message unless you really, really are interested. Um, that's, you know, an old tradition, the hostile, surly, wise old man or woman of the forest who uh, has gone to the forest for a reason. They want people to leave them alone, and if you want to contact them, the only way you can do that is on their terms, and they will set the bar pretty darn high. I don't blame them. Um, that is a kind of hostility and abuse and even denunciation that has at least a purpose to it. Um, this is a serious business, this business of becoming a renunciant or a philosopher or a yogi or whatever you want to call it, and you're not to approach these people unless you've actually done some homework and are interested in what they have to say. They're not just circus freaks. There's another kind of hostility, uh, which is um, fairly common in tantric practices. Um, where it's a means of transcending the ego, where you're deliberately spoken to in an abusive manner by uh, your guru or by your instructor or just by the other members of your tantric circle, um, in such a manner as to hopefully um, pound down the ego, pound down the arrogance. Somebody who has suffered from arrogance the way I have, and yes, I mean that, arrogance actually is something that causes one to suffer, uh, could do with a good dose of this kind of thing. This can only be applied in particularly um, arranged, contrived, and controlled uh, circumstances. You don't just walk around abusing people, trying to de-egofy them. Um, it's somebody who said, I have an ego that's too strong, or at least I believe that I do, so let's see what we can do to deal with this. Um, some people would say, you know, in, in uh, the line of a little learning is a dangerous thing, some people will then see this and, and decide that abusing everybody is good for everybody. 
no, that's not the point of it at all, because that kind of abuse has a corrupting influence on the person who is administering it. Whether we like it or not, there is that aspect of our character that wants to feel smarter, better, or otherwise above everybody else, and there's no better way to show that than to abuse other people. Um, don't raise yourself up, knock everybody else down. Um, that's just a, you know, the old-fashioned crab mentality um, defense mechanism of people who, I don't know, have unhealthy egos to the point of self-hatred, and um, they choose not to fix their own defective ego, but to destroy that of others, the better to level us all. Um, this kind of therapy, if we want to call it that, of smashing someone's ego forcibly is not the kind of thing that you just do randomly. It's just as dangerous or counterproductive as wandering up to a, a mendicant holy man and saying, tell me about yourself. I find your lifestyle very interesting and I'd like to take some photographs of me and you and bring them back and show them to my friends in Canada. Well, don't be surprised if he tells you to fuck off in his uh, language, because oftentimes they will even refuse to speak to you in English, even if they speak fluent English. Um, don't be surprised as well if your attempts to pound down the egos of people who haven't asked you to do that, uh, if their response to that is less than uh, what you expected. Humiliating people, pounding them down ego-wise, or insulting them, or abusing them, or denouncing them otherwise, tends to be counterproductive. You tell people to go fuck himself, he tells you to go fuck yourself. And nothing is solved, and you just got two people smashing endlessly into each other. Um, there are differences between assaulting someone's ego in a controlled circumstance where everyone has agreed upon what the procedure is going to be, and randomly firing it out. Finally, there's a third type of denunciation which uh, also deals with the religious type. In this case, I would say uh, the picture that I have here is not quite appropriate. I would, I would actually include a picture of um, Tomás de Torquemada, the Grand Inquisitor of the Spanish Inquisition. He would denounce and abuse people, but he would be doing so from a position of power. He would have armed retainers with the, with the power of the state behind him um, to force people to accept all the abuse that he chose to heap upon them and would force these people to undergo all the quote-unquote corrective measures uh, that are available to the advanced torture chamber. This, too, is a form of ethics by denunciation, and this, too, is of the involuntary kind. It's sort of a, uh, advanced or enhanced version of the random abuse type uh, ego pounding. Um, de Torquemada would say, look, clearly this poor soul uh, is incapable of seeing his, uh, seeing his errors, so we're just going to have to put his feet to the fire. We're just going to have to put the thumbscrews on. It hurts us more than it hurts him or her, but ultimately it's for his or her own good. We will bear the terrible burden of correcting these people. We will bear the terrible burden of cruelty and of having to do that which must be done. And we will confess copiously to other people how much it hurts us to actually have to torture other people for their own good. As we all know, of course, as was said in 1984 by O'Brien, the purpose of torture is torture. The purpose of power is power. The purpose of hatred is hatred. Torturing people, hating people, abusing people, denouncing people, humiliating people has a seductive effect on that part of us which enjoys doing it. It is not perhaps 
a dominant characteristic of humans that we enjoy inflicting pain upon others. But it's part of us, whether we like it or not. Every time you have ever insulted someone, you have shown that that aspect of human nature is in you in as much as it is in anyone else. Involuntary ego smashing is not the kind of thing that one can actually engage in to make another person less egotistical. You cannot torture someone into being a moral person. You cannot abuse or denounce someone into being a good person. Ultimately, what these philosophies of ethics by denunciation end up doing is simply saying, fine, we can't correct you, we will simply delete you. And of course, you have Auschwitz, the killing fields, or the equivalent. Ethics by denunciation is something that is an old phenomenon in our society. I would say it's ethics by fear of denunciation in its more advanced cases, i.e. the totalitarian state that was the Spain of Philip II, or the totalitarian state that was Stalin's USSR, or Pol Pot's Democratic Kampuchea. These regimes tended to go into the advanced stages, uh, particularly the last two, of you are beyond help, we must delete you from society. Nothing personal, but you're in the way. Ethics by denunciation inevitably does this. There are ways to force someone to come to terms with their own imperfections. But the only way to do that is to cooperate with such a person, not overpower them.